how do we make it make it real? So I would say to you, if you're going to say your cult, your workplace is person centered, then there should be five things that you are able to say. So if I came to your workplace and said, is your workplace person centered? You would say it is because we adopt a caring approach to how we meet everybody's needs, not just patients and residents and women, whoever, but also staff. Um, we do nurture effective relationships, so we, we strive to have good relationships uh, together and with, with the people we're working with. Uh, we do promote social belonging, that is a sense that we all have a purpose here. We, this place is not just a place I come and do my work, but a place that actually I want to be part of. Um, and that's done by a whole array of meetings and uh, social events and a whole stack of things. Um, we do create meaningful places and spaces, so we're not just, we don't tolerate you know, things being broken down for days on end. We don't tolerate you know, the patient's lounge that looks like an equipment store. Uh, we don't tolerate uh, you know, cupboards that we actually can't get anything in. We don't tolerate people invading people's spaces uh, and actually not worrying about the fact that people are invading that space. So we create spaces that are, are meaningful. And we promote human flourishing. We actually help each other uh, to grow as people. So again, a reflective question for you would be, how does your place of work, not the organization as a whole, but the bit of it within which you work, be it a ward, a unit, a clinic, a community team, how does that reflect those, those uh, principles? Because unless you have them being worked on as part of what you're doing, then it's hard to say it's a person-centered culture. So flourishing is that we are challenged, we connect with each other, our autonomy is respected, and that we're able to use this wonderful phrase called our valued competencies. Gaffney uh, refers to our valued competencies, essentially our life experiences, our wisdom, that we're able to bring that into the place where we're working alongside all the technical stuff uh, that we're, we're able to work with. I've said about person-centered outcomes. Again, as I said, we have to try and make them very real. Um, how do we capture this kind of information? How do we know whether patients and service users are having a good experience of care? or is it mediocre? How do we actually know what they're, what they're experiencing, etc.? A lot of this, what I'm going to talk about next, is covered in the most recent book, which is over there, so Randall had a, had a copy of. Um, and that's not a plug, it's just to say I'm skimming over a lot, <laughs> a lot of stuff. Because for us, practice development is a way of getting there. Um, and practice development is essentially about a process of working within units, within clinical teams, um, and trying to constantly develop these person-centered cultures. You can't ever say we have a person-centered culture, that's it. It's always a state of becoming, um, because it should be constantly changing, growing, uh, redeveloping, being reorganized, being rethought, uh, being, being innovative. But what practice development does is about having people who facilitate that kind of ongoing critical engagement with that culture. Uh, who are helping to ask the critical questions that need to be asked about why are things like they are, um, how can we get more of these kind of good things, and how can we get rid of some of the things that, that aren't so good. And it's essentially a process of facilitating learning, uh, helping people to learn through the everyday work that they're doing, uh, but trying to do it in a very structured and systematic way. So it's not just ad hoc change, but actually it's really thinking through what are the issues that need to be addressed. And I, I wanted to put this up because um, we tend to follow a particular formula, in a sense, for, for doing practice development, which very much, interestingly, matches some of the recommendations from Francis, because what Francis said up front, in terms of changing culture, was that we needed shared values. And all our practice development work starts from the point of having shared values. Um, what does this team absolutely believe in? What is it that really drives us and makes us do what we want to do? And we do that by doing values clarification work, by developing vision statements, um, and not just things that are put on pretty pictures on the wall, but actually that are discussed in team meetings and really kind of worked with as a team in order to see what it is that uh, we need to be doing next in order to change. We also need to be clear about our role as part of our values. One of the things that you know continuously uh, shocks me when I'm doing this work with clinical teams is how lack of clarity people have about their role. Um, you know, they might be working to a job description that was written 10 years ago. Um, or they have a sense of what the role has evolved into, but it often it's so unclear as to whose responsibility for what, that it's then no surprise that the issue that Francis raised about a lack of accountability kicks in, because actually nobody's really sure uh, who is accountable for what. And 
we need to be able to uh, engage creatively. And again, that's where some of the creative arts stuff kicks in. So we spend a lot of time, and I would say to you, if you're trying to look at changing your culture, to spend a lot of time looking at the values that you share. What are they? Are they explicit doing, doing this kind of work? When you've got them, they act as a kind of a benchmark. Because that's essentially what you're espousing. You're saying, this is what we believe in, what we're passionate about, and how we want to be. The next question is then, well, if that's what you're espousing, what's it like now? Is it that much of a gap, or is it that much of a gap? Where are we actually at? What's the reality of what, of what we're at? And that's when we move into kind of assessing our context by doing observations, by doing reflective conversations, by doing patient stories, uh, by collecting routine audit data that's collected, which is really valuable information. It gives us lots of, of data, as again, Francis showed. Uh, by looking at leadership, all of those things give us a picture of the now compared to what we're visioning. Does that make sense to you? And so it becomes a very hands-on, practical, sometimes fun uh, process in terms of actually unpicking what's going on in our, in, our, in our setting. So then we say, well, that's where we're at and that's where we want to be. How do we get there? And our approach is facilitated active learning. Not saying people go away and do X, Y, Z project, but actually really engaging in learning activities in work that make people look differently at how they're practicing every day. Um, 15 minutes, for example, of taking a care assistant in a residential unit out of the routine of care and just observing is so powerful. Uh, you see things that you can't believe you've missed every day of the week. And just by stopping and intentionally <coughs> looking, you suddenly see things that you can't imagine uh, were actually happening before. So all of those kind of things. Um, and using a lot of action learning, clinical supervision, uh, critical companionship, all of those processes that help us you know, to make this journey along the way, but also doing some hard change things, depending on what it is you want to change, be it meal times, handovers, infection control things, in the middle of all of that. But what I want to say to you is that if you just focus on changing things like meal times, handovers, infection control, <coughs> drug administration, whatever it is, you will spend your life changing those things unless you do the culture change stuff as well. And that's the problem, is people focus a lot on changing those things, but don't change those cultural things, those ways of being. And that's what sustains changes. It's not the actual thing that's changed itself, it's how the culture around it has changed. So, some generic principles, which I've really talked through. So I just want to end with um, a couple of examples, because one of the things that I think there is um, a danger of is seeing practice development as a thing out there as well. But actually, it's a set of processes, it's a set of uh, ways of being, ways of thinking and looking at what it is that we're doing, um, and that can be integrated with lots of other things that we're actually doing. And this first example is about how we uh, can use practice development to get and help service users to be more um, satisfied with their care. The example is uh, an acute uh, surgical unit, a nurse manager who was reviewing complaints, um, and the complaints were around things like pain management and a whole, whole array of things. And what she identified was that essentially it came down to inconsistent care decisions. So, you know, different people making different decisions but not being consistent in the way they were actually, actually making them. She did local evaluation, which was observations of practice. Um, she did some case reviews. She sat in some rounds. Uh, she observed handovers. Um, and she uh, had what, patient and family consultations, which was to kind of get their experience and their stories of experience. And she also did a review of care plans to capture the patient's voice, um, to see you know, how is the patient's voice being reflected within, within those care plans. Because you know, the kind of good day kind of, um, kind of insert can mean a multitude of actual things. Or, or the patient had a good day, is very different to saying, you know, John got up this morning, was able to do half the activities that were in his plan, uh, but felt too unwell to do the other two. They, they tell two very different stories. Um, and then she instigated a whole practice development program, which was around consistency among multidisciplinary decision making. And she did that through creating uh, spaces where they talked about decision making. So it wasn't some major intervention. She created one hour a week where the multidisciplinary team came together to review various decisions and look at how they were being consistent or inconsistent in what they were doing. They made changes in the way that they planned care. Um, they devised, devised a template for patient stories that went into care plans so that the ex patient experience could be captured on a continuous basis. Um, 
to change the way they did rounds. Uh, again, one of the France's recommendations, which is a bit embarrassing really, was that uh, no ward round should happen without a nurse being present. Um, what's happened? <laughs> uh, so they changed the way they did rounds so that there was a greater recording of the way decisions were being made. And they did some follow-up evaluation, uh, again using stories, observations, and care plans. So a really practical example of actually improving uh, patient experience in that, acute, in that acute ward. This example is about team members feeling more involved in their care. So if you think one of the outcomes from being person-centred is a greater feeling of involvement in care. So how do we help team members to feel more involved in their care? This is from a community team. Um, and this is, a, I think, a really interesting example because what this example was about was uh, a group of registered nurses who were uh, complaining that the care assistants weren't doing what they were being asked to do by the registered nurses. Familiar? So I don't know what you, healthcare assistants, is that what you call them? Mm -hmm. um, so care, the care assistants, that they were not doing uh, what they were being asked to do by the registered nurses. The registered nurses were complaining that basically they, their authority wasn't being respected by the care assistants um, and that they had, were losing their authority over, over decision making. Um, there were patient and family complaints about the attitudes of staff and the attitudes of course were negative ones and of course again the care assistants were blamed. Um, even though there was very little evidence that they were to blame, uh, but they were automatically blamed. So there was this picture of a team that wasn't that happy, really. So instead of um, kind of taking the side, let's say, of the registered nurses, the community manager actually met with the care assistants, and she did uh, one of the kind of well-worn tools and practice developments, which is claims, concerns, and issues. So what are the positive things you can say about this team? What are your concerns? And what are the questions you have about, about how we work? And what she found was, hey, Eureka, was actually the care assistants felt disengaged, disenfranchised from decision making. So they weren't part of the team, they were given stuff to do, but they weren't involved in decision making. So how could you expect them to kind of respect the fact that uh, you know, they were being, being dis disenfranchised? But in order to kind of check that out, because then you've got two stories essentially, um, what the community team manager did was did observations of practice. So went alongside people in their own homes and engaged in critical discussions and reflective discussions with them, with the different teams, to see this unfolding and actually did agree with care assistants. They were not part of decision making uh, and the registered nurses were essentially not behaving very well in terms of treating them as, as colleagues. So what she engaged in was a lot of team building work, um, again got the uh, uh, care assistants involved in the actual handovers when they were handing over care. Um, this issue about consistent, consistent assignment, which is continuity of care, so that they weren't just jumping from one client to the next, but they had consistency with the different clients in the, in the area they were working in, that they participated in care planning, um, and some role clarification, as well as leadership development for the, for the registered nurses, because clearly that was necessary as well. And the interesting thing about this example is that there's another study I'm involved in, which is about trying to prevent older people from being admitted to hospital from nursing homes unnecessarily. And what is so clear in this research is that actually the care assistants are the ones who hold all the information about the day-to-day -day well-being of residents and that nurses don't ask them. That they're, you know, they hold this bank of information and only a fraction of it makes its way into care plans and care plan reviews. So it's a big issue for us in how we work.